back to Jazz Appreciation. Today we're going to be talking about the roots of jazz. Now, while jazz is commonly said to have begun in the second decade of the 20th century, it is also rooted in cultural trends that originated in the 19th century or the 1800s. This lesson explains how jazz synthesized various kinds of music making, primarily those of African Americans. These correlate to the three categories of music that situate jazz in our society, as a kind of folk music, as popular music, and as an art form or art music, sometimes called America's classical music. This lesson will also discuss the radical changes in dance music in the first two decades of the 20th century and the impact of new radio and recording technologies. Let's begin. So jazz is jazz and ethnicity are linked together. Jazz is an African American music technically. Um, the musicians may have been African American, uh, white, and from any other uh, ethnic background. Jazz musicians, uh, jazz, sorry, jazz musicians, um, it's, it's not, African American musicians, excuse me, okay, they are, it's, it's not about race, but rather an ethnic group or based on culture. As such, the ethnic features of this music, unlike racial features, can be learned and shared. African American music Musical principles include polyrhythm, so many rhythms, call and response, blue notes, and timbre variation. These are unique to jazz, but their interaction within the genre is highly specific to it. Now, folks, I'm not going to read everything on these slides, okay? But these slides are going to be available to you on our Google Classroom, but I'm going to just touch on the, the highlights. So talking about uh, folk traditions, they serve to establish a per persistent musical identity. They help to create the hybrid nature of American culture. And there were so many different genres out there, like ballads, work songs, field hollers. So when people were laboring out in the fields, they would scream and holler back towards one another um, to keep the time moving and to keep, keep the work, work moving in, in the fields. Now here's a depiction of the legendary steel driver, John Henry. And uh, the idea behind this depiction is that um, it is exceptionally stereotypical of the African American labor during this time. Uh, but that being said, um, John Henry was a very influential uh, labor uh, during the building of the railroad, uh, especially in the Eastern United States. Now, the idea behind the legendary steel driver, John Henry, um, is that he developed this idea of call and response, the idea of chant uh, music, call and response back and forth with one another. Now this, this depiction is a symbol not only of the broad, brawny ethnic of African Americans, but of mankind's struggle with technology. John Henry has been the subject of many books and plays as well as music and art, including here in this 1945 um, depiction by the politically engaged painter and cartoonist William Groper. All right. Uh, as we said, there's also spirituals. So we have ballads, work songs, field haulers, and spirituals as different folk traditions. Now we talk about the blues. Blues is built up of three lines in the form of AAB, which distinguishes it from other musical forms. And it usually is composed of two to four lines. 
The blues has a distinctive chord progression. That's why blues and jazz musicians um, are very can very easily play a blues line um, if asked, especially if they know the scales. If you don't know the scales, it is quite challenging. Unlike ballads, blues was personal, right? Blues told the story of someone and the culture that they lived and perhaps even the community that they lived around. And during the, the slave um, uh, the slave period in especially the southern United States, blues was really big and, and um, the instrument of the banjo, which was brought over across the Atlantic during the transatlantic slave trade, as we discussed last lesson, the banjo actually developed in the south from the slave community. And the banjo became one of the primary instruments, the banjo and the guitar became one of the primary instruments of blues um, during this period. We get different styles of blues. We have country blues, okay, which is combination of folk elements and new technology such as the guitar or banjo. We get vaudeville or classical blues, okay, when blues crossed over into the pop music era. We have people like Gertrude Pritchett, who is actually known as Ma Rainey or um, the mother of the blues. Okay, and here is a depiction of um, Ma Rainey, okay, or uh, Gertrude Pritchett. And she is depicted with blues musician George, uh, Georgia Tom, who is also known as Thomas Dorsey. By 1932, Dorsey had composed Precious Lord and turned his back on secular music, right, church music. Um, becoming the father of gospel music. He became the father of gospel music. And again, his name was uh, Thomas Dorsey, or uh, Georgia Tom. And her name, Ma Rainey, or uh, Gertrude Pritchett, okay, the mother of blues. A little bit more information on vaudeville uh, or classical blues. Okay, um, the instrumentation in blues is... Um, very similar to what you see in very small ensembles, piano, upright bass, um, a singer, maybe a saxophonist or a clarinet player. And then we get to this amazing jazz musician vocalist. Her name is Bessie Smith. Now she is the most popular classic or vaudeville blues singer ever. And she, her, a lot of her recordings actually recorded very well and have transpired throughout time. She was born in Tennessee. She started as a stage professional on the Theater Owners Booking Association, or TOBA, T-O-B-A, in the vaudeville or classical blues circuit. She had her first recording in 1923, where jazz musicians learned to accompany her phrasing and copy her tone. I highly recommend that you go onto YouTube and you... Type in Bessie Smith. She has some wonderful, wonderful songs and um, and a very unique sound that a lot of jazz musicians liked to play with. Her career peaked in 1929 um, and she actually starred in a film called St. Louis Blues. And he here's actually a depiction of Bessie Smith in St. Louis Blues. Uh, this is her only film apparent, appearance in St. Louis Blues. Um, came out in 1929 when her dance partner who is played here by Jimmy Mordecai abandons her for another she pours out her heart in a performance of the title tune which was composed in 1914 by W.C. Handy so St. Louis Blues was composed in 1914 by W.C. Handy and Bessie Smith poured her heart out and sang this tune in the film uh, St. Louis Blues, released in 1929. Now, the Depression in the the um, in the early 20th century, early 1900s, uh, hit everybody hard, all musicians. And earnings and money that was coming in stopped. But out of the Depression, we get this idea of the reckless blues. People playing for playing's sake, not necessarily to make music, uh, to make money, excuse me, but to simply make music. And Louis Armstrong was one of these said jazz musicians. He played the trumpet, a very famous trumpet player. He also um, was a phenomenal singer as well. 
and use this idea of call and response. Now we move a little bit more into popular music. Out of the Great Depression comes, um, or even, sorry, at the end of the Great Depression and moving out of the Great Depression, we get this idea of dance music. Dance music became very popular, um, especially as it was played in many households with the um, advent of the radio in the kind of moving into the 1920s and 30s. Dance music became very popular because people didn't have to leave their houses in order to enjoy dance music. Before vinyls and before the radio, people had to literally leave their houses in order to enjoy this music and listen to it. But now there was this real craze for dance music in the early 20th century and late 19th century. A gentleman by the name of James Reese Europe uh, played with a group called the Castles. Now, James Reese Europe was an African-American and uh, he was very musically inclined and could play a number of instruments and uh, developed different bands uh, for specifically playing this type of music, this idea of dance music. Here we have James Reese Joyce. He's the fellow on the far left. Okay, and he is conducting and has organized this uh, small band, the Castles. Okay, very, very stellar musician, conductor, arranger, and administrator. Now, in World War I, as you see in this photo, he also proved to be a very brave soldier fighting in the trenches in France. And here, he's actually conducting the 369th uh, infantry band known as the Hellfighters in Paris in 1919. So he's actually conducting this band in 1919. And what gives it away as, as a 1919 uh, military infantry band is the type of clothing that they're wearing, right? Very military-esque. Um, uh, and the sign is in French as well. So like I said, dance music was really big during this time, especially uh, throughout the First World War. As the war um, raged on, People's spirits were down and producers of this music, of popular dance music, um, really wanted people to listen to it to boost spirits. Get people out of their houses, get people moving, get people dancing, get people smiling and kind of take their minds off of war. We move into this idea of art, uh, music as art and art music. Right, we have all this free thinking jazz where you have improvisation, learning the blues, singing your heart to content. But now we get more into the classical side of things, the art side of music and learning music theory and notation, which is really important to aspiring African American musicians. Through public education, African Americans learned classical music. Uh, for example, you've got Joseph Douglas and Citerietta Jones. Okay, but Caucasian or white people would not listen to them. There was still this deep racial divide. And the African-American communities were simply too poor to support them. So people couldn't actually go out and listen to these African-American musicians who have um, spent a lot of time training and learning the instruments, the theory and the notation. Which is really unfortunate because some of this music is, uh, especially when you look at James Reese Europe, it's, it's really phenomenal. Um, classically trained African Americans went into jazz to make a living, thus extending their classical technique and changing the standards, performance, craft, and musical ambitions in jazz. Many uh, brass bands came together, uh, built out of um, African American, former African American slaves. Uh, they came together and played in these in these brass bands. Now, the brass bands didn't just have brass instruments; sometimes you have percussion as well. Um, and sometimes they would throw in some clarinets as well into these bands. Okay, but brass bands became really popular, especially during ceremonies and funerals and parades. Remember, it's all about boosting morale. We get a gentleman by the name of John Philip Sousa. He took over the University State uh, Marine Band and made it into a top-notch, world-famous um, band. And here is uh, Mr. Sousa. 
Okay. And what's important to know about this is that he brought military music onto the concert stage. We today, even today, we still play marches in concert band music. There's still a lot of jazz pieces with the marching style embedded into it. And um, John Philip Sousa is partially, or I think, is, is quite wholly responsible for that. Bringing that military-esque style of music and the structure and the discipline um, on to the concert stage. A uh, little bit more about brass bands. Almost every American town had a brass band made up of local townsfolk to play at parades and dances. Um, and then we really move into this idea of ragtime jazz. If you have ever seen or um, heard a cartoon or a movie where they have the old saloon style filming and you got this big lug of a guy, right? He kicks open the saloon doors. You know the ones that creak open? Like, here. He comes in, ka chung, ka chung, ka chung. Who here's got my cherry pie? Or something like that, right? The music that's generally playing in the background of these old Western movies is this ragtime music. And like jazz, ragtime embodied the mix of African American and white art, popular, and folk music together. The idea of the name ragtime um, comes from. Um, literally ragged time. During the Civil War in the United States, it was mostly played on the banjo. Later, it was played on the piano, where the left hand kept a steady two-beat rhythm between bass notes and chords, and uh, while the right hand created contrasting rhythms. Now, remember, ragged time, right? That old Western feel. Okay, and the most influential, or one of the most influential musicians of this time, is um, Scott Joplin. Okay, he improvised piano ragtime uh, to a T, and he translated it into sheet music, and there was this big boom in the sheet music industry. Okay, it was widely popular and featured many composers of who Scott Joplin was the best known. Here's a photo of Scott Joplin. Okay, uh, this is one of very few photographs that survive, survive today. Okay, and this shows him as impeccably dressed and intently serious, which is very rare. We don't have a lot of photos of impeccably dressed um, African-American musicians at this time. And we have very few photos of Scott Joplin, but he was a very, very phenomenal musician. He moved to St. Louis and then to New York, publishing many rags, a ballet, and two operas. In 1903, he published The Entertainer, which would be repopularized in the 1970 film The Sting. So I highly recommend you go to YouTube, you type in The Entertainer by Scott Joplin and or The Entertainer from the film The Sting and, and have a listen. Okay. Unfortunately, he died of syphilis um, just as his recordings started to take off. Even though this was a period of intense racism, which we cannot forget about, the early 20th century, the late 19th, which is the late 1800s, and the early 20th or the early 1900s, leading up to World War I and throughout the period of the First World War, it was in a time of intense racism, especially in the southern United States, where blues and jazz are born, essentially. And it's very unfortunate that that this took place, that racism um, played a major role, unfortunately, in the development of jazz. And the idea of segregation and the idea of African-American musicians really trying to make it in this time. But African-American musicians provided not only music that offered a new sense of cultural identity, which was brought over from West Africa, but also dance music for white people as well. And here's just some listening that I think um, would be really good for everybody to take a listen to. Uh, my favorites are In the House Blues by Bessie Smith, as well as uh, The Maple Leaf Rag by Scott Joplin, a very 
famous very very famous uh, ragtime song um, as well take a look at Sugar Underwood who composed a song called Dew Drop Alley in 1927 and I would like you to compare Sugar Underwood to Scott Joplin to see how their sounds um, compare because it is very similar so take a look at these pieces YouTube them they are all on YouTube in various forms um, some of them have some weird videos attached to them. I would recommend maybe staying away from those videos. Okay. But uh, have a listen. And uh, that's all for today in terms of um, the roots of jazz. All right. Thank you very much, folks. As always, you can find this presentation and the slides on Google Classroom. Don't forget to answer this week's discussion question on the roots of jazz. We'll see you next week. Adios for now.